Hey, good morning and welcome to the Back Porch Bible Study and Prayer Time. My name is Lash. It is a beautiful September day out here on the back porch, and I want to invite you for a few moments to open your Bible or turn them on for the Back Porch Bible Study and Prayer Time. Today, we are going to be in Mark chapter 11 and Luke chapter 13, Mark 11 and Luke chapter 13. Now, we've been working through the Gospel of Mark, and you'll remember Jesus is now entering Jerusalem, and we are beginning the Passover week. And so the last passage that we looked at involved the triumphant entry. Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king. The people lay out their garments before him. They proclaim, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, literally calling out to Jesus as their savior, as their deliverer. Jesus rides into Jerusalem, goes into the temple, looks around, it's dark, and then he turns around and he goes all the way back to Bethany where he was staying. So now let's pick up the story in Luke chapter, Mark chapter 11 and verse 12. The next day when they went out from Bethany, he was hungry. So it's good to know that even Jesus got hungry sometimes. He was fully God, fully man. And here he is, he's hungry. He needs something to eat. So seeing in a distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. So this time of year, it's about uh, April. The fig trees um, would have leaves, but they wouldn't be in full bloom until later on, moving closer to the summer. However, there were these little buds that sometimes people would eat from the fig tree. And so Jesus goes out there to find out if there's any buds on the fig tree. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not season for the figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. Now let's pause right there because you have to ask yourself the question, what on earth is going on here? This is actually the first time or the only time in scripture where you find Jesus uh, destroying something in nature. He curses the fig tree. And later on, you'll find out that it works. it, It dies. But he comes to the fig tree, he's looking for fruit, he's hungry, he does not find the fruit on the tree, and so he basically responds with, may this tree never produce fruit again. You're like, what's Jesus talking about here? How does this make any sense whatsoever? Well, go back in your Bibles, or go forward in your Bibles, I should say, over to Luke chapter 13, but we're actually going back in time a bit here. So in Luke chapter 13, we have uh, in verse 6, the parable of the fig tree. And so in verse 6 of Luke 13, he tells this parable, a man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. Does that sound familiar? That sounds a lot like what happened with Jesus. So what we're seeing here in Mark chapter 11 is we're seeing the fulfillment of the parable that was told in Luke chapter 13. So a man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. And he told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? But he replied, sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce fruit next year, but if not, you can cut it down. So the parable, in the parable, The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. If you go back to Hosea uh, 7 and 9, you'll find that uh, the fig tree was a symbol in the Old Testament of Israel. And so here in the parable, Jesus is talking about how the fig tree was planted in the vineyard, that God established Israel. He blessed them. He gave them the truth. He gave them the law. Through Israel came the prophets, through Israel came Christ, and the leaves were on the tree. Everything looked as if it should produce fruit, and yet it did not. And so there is time that is given. For three years, he comes looking for the fruit on the fig tree, but he doesn't find it. And so he's about to cut it down, but then the servant replies, no, leave it Leave it one more year, let me fertilize it, and perhaps it'll produce fruit next year, but if you can't, cut it, but if it doesn't, then you can cut it down. And so the idea here is that Jesus or God was giving Israel time to repent. He was giving people time to turn to him. You'll remember John the Baptist's baptism 
repent for the Messiah is coming. And so the fig tree Israel was to repent and turn to Christ. However, that was not happening. And the time had run out. Christ's patience had run out. And so he comes to the fig tree as he's down going on his way to Jerusalem. He sees it. And in reference to Hosea, in reference to the parable earlier in his ministry, he looks at the fig tree and he says, it is not producing fruit. It is now time for things to change. And so then in verse 15 of Mark chapter 11, Mark 11 and verse 15, he comes to Jerusalem. By the way, good morning, Shara. Good morning, Paul Reed. Good morning, uh, Jim and Victoria. You're watching with Paul. That's cool. So we're glad to have you guys on live with us today. But after the fig tree incident, he comes to Jerusalem and he goes into the temple. And then again, Jesus starts acting in ways that some of us might consider a little bit irrational. He begins throwing out those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of money changers and the chairs of those selling doves and would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. Now, what on earth is going on here? Jesus is killing trees, and now he's going into the temple, and he's destroying the place. He's turning over tables. He's basically throwing um, an emotional outburst. And so you're like, what is Jesus doing here? Well, the temple had two areas that were called the Gentile courts. And those two areas were supposed to be the place where non-Jewish people could come and they could worship and they could also learn about the message of God. So those were supposed to be the mission missionary areas, the evangelistic areas of the temple. Anybody could go into the Gentile courts. However, what had happened was they had turned that area of the temple into somewhat of a uh, marketplace. So there were three big types of currency that were used in that day and time. You had the Roman currency that was pretty well good anywhere in the Roman Empire. And then you often have a provincial currency that would be good within the larger region. So you might almost think like you have the United States dollar and there would be a Texas dollar. And then they would have local money that could be used there in Jerusalem. And so people would carry various types of, of money and in order to pay the temple tax whenever they came or their offering, when they came to Jerusalem, they would have that money changed or exchanged. Now, it wouldn't be totally wrong to do some type of exchange fee in order to help the people make their living in doing that. However, they were charging exorbitant amount of prices for this exchange fee. Um, they were basically exploiting the people uh, instead of being a... Uh, house of prayer, it had become a house of prey. They were preying on the people. And then also, you would have to bring sacrificial animals for uh, the sacrifices whenever you came to the temple. Now, this has always bothered me uh, in our society. So the other day, I take the kids to, we take the kids to a movie and they want to get a icy and some candy before the movie. And I'm over there dying because the ICs are like $5 a piece, like $5 for an icy. But they didn't allow any outside food. And uh, the kids wanted an icy. So we wound up paying like 20 bucks for ICs. I'm like, oh, this is killing me. Well, these people would come to the temple and they would bring their sacrifices. Or they would sometimes wait to get to the temple for the sacrifice because the sacrifice had to be approved. So you could carry your animal like a hundred miles, get to the temple. And then they say, well, sorry, this isn't a good enough sacrifice. So they would start buying their sacrifices there at the temple. And they knew that those had already been approved. So they were charging outrageous prices for these sacrificial animals. Not only that, people were using the temple as a cut through as they would go back and forth from the markets. So Jesus looks at all this and he's like, just repulsed by it. And he overturns the tables. He uh, does not let anybody pass through who's carrying goods through the temple, trying to get to another part of the city. And he, he was teaching them, verse 17 says, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. Rather than a house of prayer, it had become a house of prey. And they were turning the Gentile courts, which was, which was supposed to be a place where all nations 
would hear the name of Christ, they had turned it into something that was just a uh, blasphemous activity towards the things of God. And so just like the fig tree, Jesus goes into the temple. He sees the ornate worship. The leaves are on the temple. The, The appearance of life is there, but Jesus examines it and discovers that it's not there. And the time of patience had ended. The time for waiting had ended. It was now time for Jesus to act. And so he cleanses the temple, but rather than repent, the chief priest and scribes heard it and start looking for a way to kill him. Now you almost just hide replaying right over verse 18 because you're like, okay, uh, he cleanses the temple. He, he does this. Um, sure. They're going to get mad, but shouldn't they have just turned? Shouldn't they have realized that he was right, that they had turned the Gentile courts into something that it shouldn't be. But instead of turning to the things of God, instead of turning to God, they continue to turn away from God. You know, this happens in our relationships as well. We have these moments where we have to decide, am I going to turn to the person? Am I going to change and make that turn to them? Or am I going to keep turning away? And here, the chief priest and the scribes, they just stayed in their hardness of heart. They turned away all the way to the degree where they were looking for ways to kill him. Now, why were they so threatened by him? They were afraid of him. Verse 18 says, because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. They knew in their hearts that he was right. They knew in his hearts, in their hearts, that what he was saying was true. They had the appearance of the flowering tree, but they did not have the fruit. The time for repentance, the time for patience had ended. Jesus was indeed going to be the triumphant king. But his throne was going to be a cross. His triumph was going to be seen whenever he exited the tomb as the risen Savior. And that moment had arrived, and Jesus was proclaiming the purity of the faith to those who had made such a mockery of it. I think we need to remember and be mindful that God is looking for authenticity within us. We might have the appearance of Christianity. We might have the flowering leaves or the, uh, the dress or the words or the big Bible or whatever that might be, but do we have the heart of Christianity? Because when Jesus went into the temple, he was looking for the heart. I think we also need to be mindful here that we are to be evangelistic. We are to be sharing the gospel. What irritated Jesus so much is that the court of the Gentiles, which was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, was so commercialized that there was no place for prayer there. There was no opportunity to hear the message. The Gentiles, first of all, were not very welcomed except for their money. And then whenever they did come there, it wasn't a place where you could really reflect upon God because what was happening around them was just noise and commerce and activity, not worship. And so Jesus was struck by this to the degree that he decided he had to act. Then I think there's a final application, and that is that sometimes whenever we see that our ministry or that our church or that our own personal heart is moving away from where it should be, we need to do something about it. We can't just stand there and, and watch it fade. We can't just stand there and watch hypocrisy and not do anything about it. Sometimes we have to have that firm spine takes a stand for truth and is willing to call it out and is willing to stand for those things which are right. Jesus did that, and he calls us to do that as well. Well, Let's transition to a time of prayer. If you have any prayer requests today, feel free to share those requests in the comments. It's always a joy to pray for you, whatever might be going on in your life. So let's pray. Take that deep breath. Center your soul. And for the next minute or so, let's just put everything on hold and think of the Lord. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for the passages of Scripture that we've seen. We pray, Lord, that we might be Christians that bear fruit. May we be authentic. Help us, Lord, not to allow worldly thinking or worldly goals to creep into the Gentile courts of our lives. 
but may you use our lives in such a way that we are connecting to people who don't know you and drawing them to you. May you use our lives in such a way that we are able to stand for truth, even whenever it's difficult. And may you also give us a heart that is soft to the word of the Lord, so that when the word of the Lord speaks to us, we do not push away and turn to our own agenda. Instead, Father, we turn and listen and hear with ears that hear and eyes that see. I pray for those today that are struggling with their health. Pray for healing in their body. Pray for those that might be struggling with relationships, that you might heal those relationships. For those that will struggle with decisions or finances or just various struggles of job and life, I pray that you might give them peace and comfort and strength to continue to do the right thing. And Lord, whenever we seek wisdom, may you grant it to us. And may we see it for what it is. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me here on the back porch. Uh, if this is helpful to you, we always appreciate whenever you give us a like or a share or a subscribe. I will be with you uh, on Thursday at 10 a.m. for the back porch Bible study and prayer time. Uh, Wednesday night Bible study. Remember, we're having our fellowship dinner uh, this evening. So that's at 615 on Wednesday night in the Life Cafe. Until next time, I hope you have a fantastic day. Take good care and much love to you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.